Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Nadia Ali. I'm the director of the Center for Middle East Studies here at Brown University. And it's my great pleasure to welcome everyone to today's event on anti-Semitism in the Middle East, the new anti-Semitism. So this event actually was suggested by my colleague, Professor Kati Galore at Brown University. And when she suggested it, I immediately felt um, that was important to organize an event. Um, like many, I'm very concerned about anti-Semitism, the rise of anti-Semitism on campuses in the US, internationally, in Europe. Um, but I'm also concerned about the way that the discussion around anti-Semitism has often been instrumentalized. And like many, I see the links between anti-Semitism and racism and Islamophobia. Currently, uh, Kati, who I'm going to introduce in a moment, Kati and myself jointly with a colleague at Humboldt University are working on the rise of far-right movements and the way that anti-gender and anti-feminist positions are central to these far-right movements. And we're looking comparatively the Middle East and Europe. And as part of those movements, um, anti-Semitism does play a role, so does racism. Now, while we see these links and parallels in today's event, we do want to focus on anti-Semitism and the discourses around it. Often, or most of the time, the conversation about anti-Semitism excludes Palestinians. But given the implication for Palestinians, we felt it was really, really important to open this state, to open this space and start what will hopefully be the beginning of a series of constructive conversations. We are not the first, they're happening. They have been happening in other campuses in the US, they have been happening um, in European context and in Israel, but it still uh, remains to be a very fraught and limited space. So let me introduce my co-panelist, first my co-organizer and colleague at Brown, Professor Katharina Galor. Uh, Kati is a Hirschfeld senior lecturer in the program of Judaic studies at Brown. She is an art historian and archeologist working in Israel, Palestine. Um, hi Kati, uh, I'm going to keep the bios to a minimum, but we're going to post them in the chat so you can um, check them out if you are uh, want to know more about publications and so on. Of course, everyone has a large list of publications. Then I'd like to introduce Noura, Professor Noura Erakat is an associate professor at Rutgers University in the Department of Africana Studies and the Program in Criminal Justice. She is also a non-resident fellow at the Religious Literacy Project at the Harvard Divinity School. Her research interests include human rights law, laws of armed conflict, national security law, as well as critical race theory. Shireen Saikali is Associate Professor of History at the University of California, Santa Barbara. She is a historian of capitalism, consumption, and development in the modern Middle East, focusing on how individuals, groups, and governments deploy both concepts and material practices to shape economy, the body, the self, and the other. Welcome, Noura and Shireen. Then I'd like to introduce to you Amos Goldberg. Professor Amos Goldberg holds the Jonah McMakova Chair in Holocaust Studies in the Department of Jewish History and the Contemporary Jury at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. He is also a fellow at the Van Leer Jerusalem Institute. Amos is a cultural historian whose work is interdisciplinary in nature, part of which focuses on the history, on the memory, and on the historiography of the Jews in the Holocaust. Welcome, Amos. And then last but not least, I'd like to introduce to you Professor Raif Zreik, who is an associate professor of jurisprudence at Ono Academic College Israel, and a senior researcher at the Jerusalem von Leer Institute. Dr. Zreik was a guest lecturer at Georgetown Law and at the Kogut Institute for the Humanities at Brown University. His main fields of research include 
legal and political philosophy. His research addresses questions pertaining to legal and political theory and issues of citizenship and identity, Zionism and the Palestinian question. So just to tell you about the structure, the format of the event today, we will be in conversation um, with our guests. Uh, Kati and I will be in conversation. We encourage you to post your questions and comments in the Q&A function, and we will have some time uh, towards the end to engage in discussion with you. So over to you, Kati. Um, thank you so much, Nadia, for framing this, uh, this panel and for introducing us all. Um, and as you said uh, at the beginning, you were immediately in, on board when, when I approached you. Uh, you shared with me the view that there is really an urgency to engage the issue and understood, of course, the highly sensitive and um, complicated nature of debating the term and the phenomenon. It's various forms of uh, associated abuse, verbal, physical, intellectual, and also political. Now, to me, the subject has a very personal dimension as my parents and their respective families have endorsed the most violent forms of anti-Semitism. Most of them died in concentration camps. Uh, only a few of them survived, including my father. And I also have experienced myself verbal and physical forms of anti-Semitism as I was growing up in Germany. Uh, it is only more recently, however, that I began conducting research on anti-Semitism and, and writing about anti-Semitism. It is, for example, a key topic in my a uh, co-authored book with Saed Achan, uh, The Moral Triangle, Germans, Israelis, Palestinians, uh, which was published in um, 2020 and then translated into German last year. And I've also written in the German um, press, uh, specifically uh, Die Zeit, which is a, a national weekly newspaper. Uh, unfortunately, what, what I've I very often regret is when I hear individuals or, or groups who make sweeping statements about anti-Semitism, they, they very often lack knowledge and, and a true understanding of anti-Semitism, of its history, and it's really vastly different contexts and usages over time. Uh, and, and the, the frequent misunderstanding and, and misuse of the term is such that uh, even renowned scholar uh, David Engel, who is a professor of Holocaust and Judaic studies at NYU, has explained why he actually has stopped to use the term anti-Semitism altogether in his publications already some 30 years ago. Um, including uh, his work on, anti, uh, on, on the Holocaust. The, the term anti-Semitism was first used in print in Germany in 1879. Antisemitismus at the time was understood as a sort of Jew hatred. And I will actually not go into how it has taken on new forms of meaning, how it has been entangled with, with various dimensions of religious, cultural, and racial expressions of aversion and violence in different geopolitical and historical contexts. What we do want to focus on in, in, the, in the very short time frame we, we have at our disposal today is to highlight some of the most problematic misconceptions of anti-Semitism, especially as relevant to the critique of Israel. And uh, perhaps to start with, with relatively recent understandings of anti-Semitism, my, my suggestion would be to begin with a 2016 IRA and the 2021 JDA definitions. 
IRA being short for the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance and uh, JDA being short for the Jerusalem Declaration of Anti-Semitism. And I can really not think of anyone who would be better suited to do so than Professor Amos Goldberg. Um, Amos, um, could you please explain the, the contexts of these two different definitions and perhaps also your role in, in this attempt to rethink, redefine uh, the meaning of anti-Semitism and, and perhaps also explain um, what your primary motivations were. Uh, thank you very much for holding this literally very important webinar and for inviting me to talk. Uh, I think uh, it's a very um, unique position to be here as a, an Israeli Jew on a minority, as a minority among the speakers, and it's a very good setting. So I congratulate you, congratulating you for that. Okay, to a large extent, what we call today the IRA working definition of antisemitism was born following the UN Conference Against Racism that took place in Durban, South Africa in September 2001, one year into the Second Intifada. Durban Conference expressed and symbolized the gradual penetration of the harsh anti settler colonial discourse on Israel and Zionism, which until then was commonplace, of course, among, mostly among Palestinians, radical activists, and Marxists, it penetrated into mainstream international discussion on the highest level. This, I believe, was one of the major triggers that encouraged Israeli and Jewish organization leaders, uh, scholars to articulate a definition of antisemitism that should counter what they defined as the new anti Israeli. Uh, understanding that this radical critique of Israel and Zionism is actually is, 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 is a Jewish entity. Following years of discussion, such a definition was launched by the American Jewish Committee in 2005. It was promoted by very powerful Jewish, and I, I stress also non-Jewish actors in various international arenas, benefiting from the change in global political tendencies that follows 9-11, which actually happened three days after the closing of the Durban conference and its subsequent war on terror and other upheavals that we all know from the beginning of the 21st century. In 2016, an influential international body called the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, or the IRA, adopted this definition with some insignificant changes in order to fight rising antisemitism, particularly in Europe. This organization, which was established in 1998, former president, Swedish prime minister, Göran Persson, defined its mission to promote Holocaust education, remembrance and research. This organization is one of the frequently mentioned examples of what many see as the globalization of West Americanization or Westernization of Holocaust memory. This body is currently comprised of 35 member states, all except perhaps for Argentina, belong to the global north, i.e. European and Western states. To put it bluntly, it's a very white Eurocentric organization. Since its adoption by the IRA, many hundreds of organizations and institutions adopted it too. From football clubs, airliners, and university to the Trump and Biden administrations, many European states, and the EU itself. Actually, it is gradually becoming the standard international accepted definition of antisemitism, unfortunately, without a significant political pushback. Uh, the definition uh, is comprised, uh, perhaps you can post the, um, the link to this definition. I, I, I sent you, Katya. The definition is comprised of a vague, vague, vague uh, and clumsily articulated core, what is called core definition which actually says very little, and 11 examples which explain and concretize the definition, the core definition. Seven of the 11 examples refer to allegedly Israel-related antisemitism. This mean, even, means, even before looking at the content of these examples, that the definition identifies the allegedly Israel-related antisemitism as the core and the most significant uh, of contemporary antisemitism. 
A second flaw of this definition is that it disconnects antisemitism from any other form of racism and the fight against it from any larger emancipatory or even liberal and democratic struggle. Six years since its adoption, one can assess its actual impact. And oh my God. First, let me say that there is not even one piece of evidence that it helped fight antisemitism anywhere. On the contrary, it diverts attention from growing right wing violent antisemitism and particularly and practically legitimizes it. It also makes it very difficult to bond with other minority groups in order to fight antisemitism and other forms of racism. Second, in practice, what it actually does, it delegitimizes the uh, as anti Semitic, the Palestinian, historically well founded narrative of the conflict which perceives Israel as a settler colonial state. As it states that claiming that Israel is a racist endeavor is anti Semitic. In fact, it equates anti Zionism with anti Semitism. Please go. Please go. Third, it makes any critique of Israel susceptible to being labeled as anti Semitic under the allegation of what it called double standard. And here there are hundreds of documented examples for that. Indeed, Israel reached a point where it cannot justify policies within liberal discourse of equality and human rights. Its last resort is the discourse of antisemitism. And this tactic is extremely useful because it has a double impact. First, it has a frightening chilling effect as any engagement with the issue of Israel-Palestine is suspected to become an issue of antisemitism. And second, and this is even more severe, it managed to transform the whole discourse on Israel-Palestine from focusing on reality, the occupation, annexation, apartheid, settler colonialism, et cetera, to, the endless, to an endless debate whether even talking about these issues is anti-Semitic. In this discourse, Israel is not accused, but the accuser who holds the higher moral grounds while the Palestinians are not victims anymore, but anti-Semitic villains. I therefore perceive the IRA working definition as a direct assault on truth, and as such, is part of contemporary troubling zeitgeist. But more than that, I see it as yet another manifestation of centuries old European civilizing mission in which the West wishes to educate the East while in fact committing crimes and injustices and causing great harm. This campaign of anti-antisemitism has become legitimate and it become a legitimate and respectful way for many in the West to express and enact the racism under the guise of fighting against one of its most lethal forms, anti-Semitism. On March 2021, following uh, an almost year-long process of Zoom meeting and uh, seminars, an international group of some 20 scholars of anti-Semitism and related topics launched the JDA, the Jerusalem Declaration on Antisemitism. The JDA was initiated as an opposition and fundamental alternative to the IRA a definition which was perceived by all groups, group members as flawed and harmful. It was harmful to the fight against anti Semitism, and this was a major concern uh, for all. It was uh, harmful to, the to free speech, and it was, uh, it was silencing uh, uh, Palestinians, the Palestinians, and supporters of Palestine. Uh, and I was among the initiators and drafting. By now, some 350 scholars the vast majority of whom specialize in anti-Semitism, racism, Holocaust, Jewish history, and other related topics signed in support. Um, uh, unlike the IRA definition, the JDA is not a manifesto and does not set itself as the Ten Commandments of the fight against anti-Semitism. It is a political intervention in specific time in history that aims to distinguish, again, between or draw the border between anti-Semitism and Israel critique and anti-Zionism. That is not, that is to raise the fight against anti-Semitism beyond the political fray on uh, Israel-Palestine. And as one of its in initiators and drafters, I'm well aware to the compromises and even flaws of the JDA as it was a political interve intervention. Perhaps we can talk about it in the discussion. 
But a year and a half after the launch, I still believe that it contributed tremendously to the fight against the IRA and its spirit. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Amos. Uh, Kati, if it's okay, I'm going to turn to uh, Raif now and uh, really sort of following up um, on uh, this introduction. Um, Raif, I know that you were amongst the initiators uh, of a letter that was signed by many Arab intellectuals that condemned the rise of anti-Semitism while also challenging the IRA definition. And, and you have argued that this definition has been instrumentalized. So I was wondering if you can tell us about this initiation and explain how you think that um, the definition has been instrumentalized and by whom. Yeah, I would like to thank you for holding this event again, especially in these days where it's really becoming very difficult um, to speak about these issues openly. It's even probably becoming more difficult to be a Palestinian um, in this climate. Um, let me say a few words about this idea. I don't know if to call it abuse, uh, because probably it was meant to be used this way. So the idea of abuse presumes that it was meant to do one thing and then it's ended up doing another thing. Uh, I think the definition is doing what Israel intended it at the first place to be doing. Um, and here is, I, I want to use sort of my legal expertise to explain something, why, why this is something tricky about the definition. Uh, first, about the form of the definition. The definition is considered to be kind of a soft law. So it's not a law. So it doesn't have to go through the procedure that parliaments go through or the Congress. So it's a soft law. And by saying that it's a soft law, it gives the feeling that many people who are voting for it can say, okay, after all, it's soft law. It's, it's not really, really binding. And because of its soft law, also, it doesn't have to stand in the sort of uh, um, uh, limits of constitutional laws, uh, uh, constitutional restriction. Because if you want to pass a law, the law should meet sort of um, a constitutional constraint regarding freedom of speech or other consideration. But when you say, no, no, it's a, just a declaration, it's not a soft law, then it doesn't have to go all these sort of uh, restriction. And many people or many Congress or whatever, many parliament members find it sort of easy to, to accept the definition because it's just for educational purposes. Now, We've noticed that, and we've witnessing the last five years since its endorsement, that actually what seems to be soft, it's extremely harsh in reality. So the softness shouldn't be actually uh, delusional. The, its impact is really, really, really is, is felt in every corner um, all around the world in terms of freedom of speech and limitation on Palestinian activism and shaping the discourse on, on Palestine and putting restrictions on, on several academics, on self-citizenship, setting the agenda, uh, etc. So this is, this is one thing. Now, the other thing it's important to notice that probably one might say, OK, but we have sort of legal guarantees. Uh, we have the Constitution probably in the America or the human rights regimes in Europe that actually we can still have some room for freedom of speech and the courts can defend us and please look at the court decisions in this regard. So probably one might say that actually don't over exaggerate. And here's the issue is not um, if, the, if the human rights court or the American constitution would allow more freedom of speech or less freedom of speech. The issue is the climate. The environment that has been created in the last few years, the chilling effects that it creates, the fact that you are as a university professor, all of a sudden comes um, a complaint against you that your papers uh, are having an anti-Semitic uh, flavor to them. And then a committee is being set in order to review your papers, your ideas, and your research. 
And probably you spend two years and then probably the committee would come up to the conclusion, no, you're not anti-Semitic. Wow, I'm not anti-Semitic and you should go celebrate. But clearly what we're witnessing here is a chilling effect that people would be far more reluctant to express their ideas, to choose their research agenda um, in, in public. Now, what we've been uh, witnessing, I, I'll say, I, I would just give a few examples from probably hundreds of examples. There's one side that gathers all these examples of, of many pro-Palestinians group that have been targeted. But let me say one more thing about the definition and the distance between the definition and its implication or its application actually, to the point that today, I think it doesn't make sense to, to speak about, oh, there is the definition in itself and it should be sort of separated from its uses or its application. The definition is its application. The definition is its effect. The definition doesn't stand on its own. But if we take for a moment just to, to, to show the slippery nature of the definition, the definition is so vague, so open-ended, and the question, it's not what the definition mandates, but what the definition allows. Because it's of its open texture, it allows so many things in its interpretation. And who interpret the, the declaration? Those who have the power. Those who have the power are mostly Israel, US, and the Western government. And between the openness of the texture and the application lies all the story. I'll give just one example. I don't want to go through a deep analysis of, of the definition. Let me just give you one example just to show the fact that there is so much latitude, so much room for interpretation. So what actually matters is the way it's being applied. Let's take, for example, not the definition itself, but the examples mentioned in the definition. Um, one of them speaks that denying the Jewish people right of self-determination is anti-Semitic. Now, if I was sitting in a room and there's a discussion as a philosopher of international law and what I might say, look, Jewish right for self-determination, sometimes self-determination can mean um, only cultural self-determination. So if somebody really objects to Jews having cultural self-determination, uh, that's really, he probably might be um, uh, anti-Semitic because to deny a group to live their cultural, religious life and to celebrate their language, um, that's really, you, you must really have an attitude against Jewish, you have, must have a Jewish sentiment. So you might vote for that actually. Because there is nothing in international law that says, by definition, international law means statehood, sovereignty, and closed borders. Now, when it comes, now you have this definition, and then you can work with it. And I'm now the state of Israel, and I can work with this definition and see how things can go forward from here, how it could be interpreted and applied. Self-determination for most people resonate actually with the idea of statehood, that the right of the group to decide the way it wants to conduct its political life. One of these things, one of the issues that are connected with the idea of self-determination is the right to close the borders. That means that the state can decide on the a, a, a demographic nature of the country. That is taken for granted in the US, for example. It's a prerogative for the set of the department to decide who's in, who's out, and to put um, the regulation uh, that decides who can come in. Now, that means in Israel, that Israel has the right to close the border. Now, what does that mean? That means Israel can decide to say no to the right of the return to the Palestinians. Now that means that if you're a Palestinian demanding the right of return, then you're questioning of the Jewish people right to self-determination. Then, ergo sum, you're anti-Semitic. Now you see what's going on here. The right to self-determination ends up 
legitimating calling those who asking right of return anti-Semitic. Now, what does that mean actually? That, that means that you can do ethnic cleansing and get away with it. That means that Israel has the right to expel the Palestinians. Now, does that, how does that square with any human rights discourse in international law? You see how- Sorry, uh, that... sorry Raif, uh, can I just ask you to come to a close? We'll come back to you, but um, in the interest of time, could you try to close that uh, part now? Yeah, yeah, I can close that part. I said yes. it all in this in in in, in this regard that yes. how something that appears to be defending Jewish rights ending up defending yes. Israel right to do ethnic cleansing. This is the distance mm -hmm. that some people find it they can uh, sort of uh, have sympathy for the for the definition, but when it comes to reality, to application, it could be completely flipped on its head. Yes. So I stop here. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Raif. We'll come back to you, but now uh, over to you, Kati. Yes, I actually would like to, to ask the next question uh, to Shireen. In a um, 2016 New York Times opinion piece with a um, title, Anti-Zionism Can and Should Be Anti-Racism, you, you uh, wrote, and let me quote from this article, to equate opposition to Zionism with anti-Semitism is to deny the history of both. Uh, um, Shireen, could you um, contextualize the quote and, and perhaps elaborate a little bit on what exactly you thought was important to stress when engaging anti-Semitism? Thank you. Thank you, Nadia and Katarina, for bringing us together. Um, I'm going to kind of step back and just um, get a little bit more basic. <laughs> um, uh, I think it's really important for all of us to um, engage with the history of anti-Semitism. I think one of the ways that um, anti-Semitism has been instrumentalized by um, particular groups, also by um, um, the state of Israel, kind of obscures the ways in which we um, have to really engage it as critical to our anti-racist work. So anti-Semitism is a 19th century outgrowth of Judeophobia, which is, is has existed for as long as there has been as there have been Jews. And during the Middle Ages, it became this kind of constitutive underbelly of the Catholic Church's claim to being a quote unquote civilizing force. The precariousness of Jewish life began to recede in the 1700s with the Enlightenment as Jews began to gain equal legal rights, at least in theory. Um, but the majority of the world's Jewish population lived in Russia, where an autocratic monarchy not only continued to deny them civ civic equality, but incited deadly pogroms against them. And even in the lands of the Enlightenment and political emancipation, Jewish people were one of a series of others, groups to be transformed and redeemed. Indeed, much Enlightenment thought was premised on this hierarchical understanding of humanity. And during the 19th century, with a shifting world order, the category of race became a dominant way to establish this hierarchy through exclusion and, safe and scapegoating. Jews became a racialized, understood as a quote unquote, biologically irredeemable, unassimilable other. This racialization, and I think this is a really important point that I'll come back to in the second um, portion, uh, uh, in the second question I'll, re I'll receive, is that this racialization paralleled and built on the racialization and violent exclusion of Black, Brown, and colonized bodies. For Jews, it would lead to genocide. That's anti-Semitism. What is Zionism? 
Zionism is a national political movement that began in the late 19th century as a response to anti-Semitism. Zionism was neither the only Jewish response to anti-Semitism nor the most popular until the Nazi persecution of Jews began in the 1930s. And here I think it's very important and linked to our discussion today that Zionism continued the Enlightenment's idealization of the nation state and its hierarchical understanding of humanity. It promised Jews that they could finally become European, but only by leaving Europe. For Zionists, Jews' claim to a piece of land are more legitimate than and outweigh those of the Palestinians who have resided on that land for hundreds of years. And, and this logic, right, has been used to justify um, uh, the ongoing Nekba, the, 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 the dispossession of Palestinians and the denial of basic civil and political rights. And so I think it's really um, important to understand that, that the struggle for Palestinian freedom is a crucial step in ending this logic of racialization and civilizational hierarchy, uh, because this logic itself in this very moment measures Palestinian life as less valuable than Israeli life. And it makes Palestinians available to premature death as our um, colleague Tariq Rodi often reminds us, which is the really material embodiment of a racial uh, 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 regime when you become available to premature death, as we see with um, Palestinians on a daily basis. And so here I think that critiquing this logic of, of racialization, uh, of, of hierarchy, um, is, is a moral responsibility for all of us. Irene, thank you so much. Um, I think, Nadia, you will ask the next question. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Shireen. So, Nura, I'd like to ask you, um, I know that you have been involved in and also have been a researcher of renewals of Black Palestinian solidarity. And I, I wonder what this um, involvement and also the research has illuminated in regard of to how we understand both anti-Semitism and anti-racist struggles today. Thank you, Nadia, Kati, and all. Um, it's exciting to go last in this first series of questions, especially because so much of this is scaffolding onto one another and will be resonant. So um, let me answer the question directly about the relationship between anti-Semitism and other racial movements and what's been illuminated in my own research. So let me start by saying that Black uprisings more generally outside of the solidarity framework have recentered racism and as an analytic within academic circles as we are well aware of, as well as among movements who have, have centered it uh, once again to move us forward. The solidarity framework, Black Palestinian solidarity catalyzed an analytical renewal to understanding racism and colonialism as co-constitutive in global structures of domination in a way that shepherds or marshals um, an anti-imperial politics. So one place that um, this happens is in Durham, North Carolina, where a Jewish, Black, and Palestinian coalition abolishes police exchanges, the Durham Police Department's police exchange program in Israel. Now note, this is happening across over half a dozen states across the United States, which means we're talking about who knows how many cities, but Durham is the only successful municipal campaign in the United States to abolish such trainings, uh, although the program has existed since 2001 across the US. So part of my research was going into Durham to um, interview the league or organizers to reconstruct a chronology of the campaign from inception to victory to understand what made it successful. I'll spare you those details, but here's what it reveals about anti-Semitism and anti-racism. So firstly, the campaign itself is iterative as most of our thinking and our movements are. It begins in 2014 when JVP 
ends a contract with G4S, but the organizers are unsatisfied with their victory because one, the media completely erased Palestine in its discussion of all of G4S's nefarious entanglements, um, does not discuss its use in Israeli prisons, surveillance, and so forth. Second, the city ended up replacing G4S with another security form, a firm in the midst of black uprisings and the organizers in the midst of, of those uprisings understood that replacement as a reformist victory rather than an abolitionist victory. And so many of them had become abolitionists in the course of black uprisings. So they organized themselves anew, they centered their relationships with one another to create this intersectional coalition and target the police training program in Israel. The campaign, ultimately passes in a resolution, a unanimous vote of 6-0. This is a big deal, right? And while the local police, um, the local fraternal police order opposed the resolution, the greatest opposition came from Jewish Zionists. They accused the initiative of being anti-Semitic on two grounds. It singles out Israel, even though the Durham police only trained in Israel. And it suggests that the campaign is suggesting that the US police are violent and anti-Black because they trained in Israel, which of course nobody ever said. Um, this campaign, um, uh, this campaign is all, sorry, this campaign is happening in the midst of anti-Semitic violence in the United States and abroad. A lot of it incited by the Trump administration and encouragement of white uh, supremacists to, to, to be more bold even, including in Pittsburgh and in Charlottesville. So in this context, right, the campaign, black uprisings, targeting of the Durham police exchange, Jewish activists across the spectrum are eager to protect their communities and are figuring out how to do that best. What I found in Durham is that the Jewish community seemed to fracture along Zionist fault lines that corresponded to abolitionist ones. Jewish opponents to the city council statement were in fervent support of Israel, a barricaded nuclear power and alignment with global superpower as a necessary safe haven for Jews. In contrast, Jewish advocates of the resolution self-identified as anti-Zionist and abolitionist and understood that their safety and future is inextricable from that of other targeted communities. For the latter, more policing, higher walls, greater violence were not the source of their survival. Instead, they pursued an abolitionist future where provision for their collective well being would create a safe haven for all. So, here, let me share with you um, one I don't know what my time is, so possibly two anecdotes that, that share some of this. So, uh, Sandra Korn is one of the JVP organizers, and she, uh, in the, you know, is like everybody else upon hearing neo Nazis mar marching on Charlotte, chanting, Jews will not replace us, is, in or is organizing with her synagogue of how to respond. In discussing appropriate responses with her fellow board members in the synagogue, she found herself in a minority that opposed greater law enforcement involvement. The majority of her synagogue's board members wanted to get an armed officer to patrol their place of worship and enhance their collaboration with local and federal law enforcement. Horn believed that they could only be achieve safety through solidarity because abolition, quote, was not something for black people, but something for herself as a queer Jew and made her transform from a solidarity activist for Palestine to understanding her own stake in the struggle. Similarly, Lara Haft, who is part of the campaign, recalls the same moment when, or a similar moment when neo-Nazis were distributing pamphlets attacking Blacks, Muslims, and Jews, right? So this is a broad attack, similar to what Amos is telling us, the severing of anti-Semitism from other forms of racism is very dangerous, even though neo-Nazis are attacking Everyone, her rabbi's response was to grow stronger in his opposition to the city council statement to abolish the police training and in favor of greater FBI involvement to combat anti-Semitism. Half thought, quote, this was nuts because one third of the campaign was Jewish and the neo-Nazis targeted all of us, end quote. More for her, greater safety meant getting police, quote, out of her shoals in order to better protect Jews of color and to be in community with Black and Muslim folks who were explicitly targeted by the FBI. The takeaway here is how those activists who understood anti-Semitism as flowing 
from a similar source of harm towards Black and Palestinian communities and other brown um, and, and racialized communities um, were, were flowing from white supremacist formations, that these activists were committed to both abolition and anti-Semitism. It was both the understanding that anti-Semitism was not a sui generis form of racism or, or distinct unto its own, and that their safety was not achieved with borders and police, but in solidarity with one another. Thank you. Well, it's um, so important to actually, you know, delve in and we are aware of these issues often in sort of macro, but it really, um, I feel, I gain a totally different level of understanding, uh, listening to this very specific, uh, concrete example. Thank you, Nura. Well, uh, back uh, over to you, Kati. Um, yes, thank you. So, um... I would like to ask Amos, um, having followed quite closely how debates on anti-Semitism have been approached very differently in different contexts. Uh, there's also, of course, differences in media coverage and uh, policies and sanctions, de depending really on the national or uh, religious context. The, the discourses in the US within Palestinian Israeli societies, both in the Middle East and in, uh, also in, in, in various uh, diasporas uh, are, are really hugely distinct. Um, uh, even just within the European context, uh, we see significant variations from country to country. And I'm thinking of course of uh, Germany where, where I uh, conducted research uh, comparing it to France or, or Poland and Hungary, uh, not to speak of course of the fact that no one context produces a, a monolithic engagement with anti-Semitism. Um, I'm thinking of course, uh, not of course, I'm thinking for example, just um, on the, Brown campus, there's so many different views and positions. And um, so Amos, um, I know you, you won't be able to lay out all the differences within three minutes, uh, but I would appreciate if you could perhaps highlight some of the differences you have observed and perhaps also experienced. I mean, you, you know the is Israeli context very well and, and have lived in the US and, no Europe. Um, uh, thank you. Yeah, I have five minutes. So I would say that obviously um, that the problem is that anti-Semitism is real and, and uh, many places it's on the rise. So the whole discussion takes place in a reality that does call for action. And, and we heard the different uh, uh, ways how to confront it, or either with solidarity or with the aligning yourself to the power. And um, uh, so, first of all, I think it became, this issue became, at least among Jews, but not only among Jews, I would say a very divisive uh, issue. Uh, I would say, broadly speaking, in, in, in Jewish communities, uh, some focus on, like, without proportion, some focus on the, what they call left wing and the Islam, Islamist and Palestinian anti-Israeli anti-Semitism and see it as it's more the most uh, vicious and important uh, one to deal with and the other with right wing and, and this uh, right wing uh, populist and, uh, and, and uh, regimes. And this is a kind of a very divisive. Uh, so, but I think when we, it comes to the IRA and its spirit as I, as I, this, this is objectively like looking from above and saying something very general, but I think if I think of the IRA spirit that I've uh, just spoken about, I think three major political forces are pushing it very forcefully on local and global scale. And uh, it's interesting to see each, because each of them its own reason and therefore is involved in slightly different discussion. Obviously Israel is pushing it for pure political reasons. I really don't think Israel is that interested in issue of anti-Semitism per se, unless, unless it becomes really broke. But uh, it is yet another mean to push the Palestinian issue off the international table for Israel. But in fact, uh, it's not a major issue in the Israeli public discourse at all. Now Jewish community, now the, the second stakeholder is, if we can generalize, is Jewish communities and organizations in America and Europe. 
Most of them also push this definition and its spirit because they tend to identify with Israel and are looking to protect it from criticism. But actually there's much more to it. In recent decades, and that was proved, and as Jewish emancipation in the West, and particularly in this moment, the historical moment, when Jewish emancipation in the West reached a point it had never reached in Jewish history, Israel has become a dominant and essential part of Jewish identity in the diaspora, even among those who do not define themselves as Zionists. So we've just heard like Jewish Voice for Peace, not everybody, but it has become much more dominant than before, uh, like 20 or 30 years ago. And then any harsh assault on Zionism in Israel is experienced by many Jews as attacked on, I think, falsely, but this is how they experience it on, on Jewish identity, therefore perceived as anti-Semitism. Moreover, sometimes uh, anti-Israel criticism in, uh, in, in, in demonstration indeed slip to become implicitly or explicitly anti-Semitic anti when chanting slogans in favor of Hitler or holding Jews, all Jews accountable for what Israel is doing. So, uh, so, and here there's a big difference between Europe and America. Whereas until some two decades ago, Jewish American support of Israel was very solid and conditional, while European Jews were much more critical. Today, they switch sides. Still, the big and very powerful Jewish American organizations, such as the American Jewish Committee, uh, Simon Wiesenthal Center, the ADL, and other, are promoting the IRA and its spirit on local and international levels. But there are very loud progressive Jewish voices, as we just heard and organization that are counterated, and not only the Jewish Voice of Peace, but also liberal Zionists. Uh, the most successful one is the Canadian group, Independent Jewish Voices, which reached huge successes in pushing back against the IRA. And there are, um, okay, this makes the entire discussion on the IRA and its spirit an internal Jewish discussion. In Europe, these voices are very weak, and therefore the IRA is perceived by the Europeans to represent all Jews. This, bear, this bears significant consequences. The third actor, which is currently the strongest one pushing uh, it most forcefully is the EU backed by most of mainstream liberal conservative and right-wing politics in, in Europe uh, in, in, in some different ways also in North America. And this is why it's so powerful and, and, and devastating. I think different interests and ideologies are driving various actors in this broad spectrum to support the IRA. I think it's a combination of supporting Israel. Israel has become very strong and desirable. Implicit or explicit, this is a way, uh, uh, implicit or explicit, many times explicit Islamophobia, racism, anti-immigrationism, in some uh, corner quarters of population also growth of dislike to the Palestinian code. But at least among some liberal Europeans, there is something else playing out here. And this is, this is the tricky part. The fight against antisemitism and fostering Jewish life after the Holocaust became in the last two or three decades, essential and dominant part of European identity. And since the major Jewish organization and communities in Europe see harsh rukit of Zionism in Israel as a form of antisemitism, that makes them feel uncomfortable in their places of residence. And EU and the EU and most of the states adopt this perception in antisemitism. They call it victims-based perspective. Now, I think it's all wrong, of course, but this is part of the part of the motivation, apart from what I said before, in supporting this on, among liberal Europeans. Obviously, in Germany, and for understandable reason, the situation is a bit different. And could, but to my opinion, could only be explained with psychological and anthropological vocabulary, such as moral panic, exorcism, purification, social paranoia, and fear of contamination. There's so much to, to talk about, to say about Germany, on which Kathy Gallo, uh, you've heard, wrote extensively and beautifully. But I will give just one example to show how, where it, I mean, where it, uh, how, where did it, it go? I mean, it, it, the situation in Germany is, is awful. Now, a Palestinian artist was conceived as anti semitic as anti an anti semite, because he worked in a cultural center in Ramallah, which is named after the Palestinian progressive educator Khalil Sakakini, who died already in 1953, and who had very many Jewish friends in Jerusalem. But in a few lines in his diary, 
express the hope that Rommel in the war, in the Second World War, will liberate Palestine from British colonialism. This was enough to tag the artist with no connection to Sakakini whatsoever. I mean, of course, not Sakakini is also not Italian at the same time, but if not, and in 2022, as an anti Semite, I think this tells it all. Indeed, Germany holds today a real witch hunt to get almost any form of critique against Israel and Zionism and any Palestinian authentic view. Yeah, thank you, Amos. And it, of course, brings back so many um, memories of the interviews we conducted for our um, ethnographic study on, on, on the questions of uh, anti Semitism in, in contemporary. Germany, when, when we did our uh, field work in 2016 and 17 with, uh, with my colleague Saed Achan. And so one of the biggest ironies for me was um, that there is this genuine enthusiasm about among Germans that there is this very significant revival of um, Jews through the relatively important migration of, of Israelis. I mean, so many, there, there was a real Jewish life. You hear Hebrew in the streets, you see Hebrew signs, there are Hebrew business, businesses. And, and, and it, I mean, it's, it's a real presence and part of, of uh, the Berlin community. And so there is this excitement. Um, uh, ironically, many of these uh, intellectuals and artists who come to Berlin are, um, lefties and 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 um, dare as as most people in, in in the world dare to criticize their their government and and so here Germans will call these Israelis um, not collectively but it it happens over and over that Israelis uh, Germans are not happy with the way um, these Israelis engage with their own government. Uh, with a critical voice and, and we'll call them anti-Semites. Germans will call Israelis in Germany anti-Semitic. And, and that's really the irony. Uh, we both just, experienced it, Kat. Yes, <laughs> just another example of, of, of these really um, mind-boggling contradictions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and on the other side of the coin, so I'm I also, grew up uh, in Germany, actually very close to where Kati grew up. And um, so I've just been to a conference, a big conference in Berlin, and I was really was struck by the fact, but maybe not surprised that a panel on Palestine didn't even have one single Palestinian speaker. And um, when I spoke to my colleagues about it, they said, well, you know, we have to be very careful. We can't even invite Palestinians. And that really leads me to the question that I would like to ask Raif, which is what, in your view, is the relationship between anti-Semitism and the question of Palestine? Yes. I mean, as Amos said, uh, um, Israel is trying to turn into any conversation about Palestine as a conversation about anti-Semitism. Um, and here we have to notice there are two conversation that is being running around and both of them are important and both of them should be dealt accordingly. One is a conversation about anti-Semitism, its causes, etc., and fighting it. And there's an other different conversation about Palestine. The parameters, the entry point to the discussion about Palestine is different from the parameters, the historical conditions speaking about anti-Semitism. And it's a mistake to collapse the two question as if they're just one question. The entry to understanding, to analyzing, um, to thinking about Palestine, there is that Palestine is a question of settler colonialism, of occupation, and of disposition. So this is the entry point. It's part of parcel of a whole uh, discussions and a whole struggle of the 20th century about decolonization. Now, probably the, the Palestinians were in a bad situation or a lucky situation. Everyone can decide uh, on that. 
Uh, but the Palestinians were victims of the Jews that were the ultimate victim probably in the um, 20th century. And here the two conversations come into dialogue with, with, with each other because it's different probably, um, uh, historically it's different. Uh, when I was speaking about why it's coming to settle in Indiana, um, in terms of the moral appeal to the rest of the world. And when those who are coming to settle in Palestine are coming as refugees. Now, most settler colonies, uh, there's the element of refugeesness. I mean, most people coming to the uh, new world to settle are refugees. But probably the case of the Jews is outstanding in that, given the history of the 20th century. Now, what does that mean after all? That means different thing. That means that the case for Palestinians to prove their case is always overshadowed by the fact that the Jews are victims of the 20th century. To make their case clear, they have to spend sort of, uh, it, it's, it's more difficult to prove, uh, to prove their case in, in this regard. But the Palestinians, what they see is different from what the Europeans see or feel or configure. For the Europeans, they see the backs of the refugee running for his life following the Nazi regime and the Holocaust. And this is the image that he has in his mind when he speaks about Palestine. This is the main image. Uh, and probably when, uh, when President... Uh, uh, Biden says, I'm a Zionist. I don't know exactly what he was thinking when he said that or what he meant by that. But I'm trying to think probably he means to say that I'm for the idea of the Jews having a safe place to live in their own country. Probably he's not meant, to, he didn't mean to say that I'm for the expulsion of the Palestinians or for the continuation of the occupation. But what you see in Europe, it's different what the Palestinians see. We, the Palestinians, see the soldier, the face of the soldier, not the back of the refugee. We see him not as victim, but as a victimizer, not as a minority, but as a majority, not as the prosecuted, but the one as prosecuting us, not the one that's refugee, but the one that's turning the Palestinians into, uh, into refugees. So in this sense, one can think, of different relations between, between the two. But the first thing to recognize that the anti-Semitism, as Shireen mentioned already, is basically forced and foremost started as a European question. The Jewish question is a European question. But both the Zionists and the Europeans wanted to solve this problem outside Europe. The Jews should go outside Europe in order to join Europe. But by leaving Europe, Zionism didn't reject the, uh, let's say, the logic of Europe, the logic of ethnic, racial, pure state. Actually, they adopt this logic, and in one sense, they want to extend it outside Europe. So in this sense, the establishment of Israel is not exactly the triumph of enlightenment. It's not the triumph of Kant. It's not the triumph of liberal cosmopolitanism and the idea that we can have a liberal state that is open for all and guarantees equality for all. Actually, the establishment of Israel is one way or another is conceding to the idea and to the claim that there is no way that different people from different races can live peacefully together. This is, at the end of the day, the meaning of the established, at least one meaning of the establishment of the state of Israel. So as Palestinians, we are not responsible for what happens to the Jews in Europe. Now, that doesn't mean that we are under no responsibility how to deal with this victimhood. But it's clearly, it's too much to ask for the Palestinians to pay the full price of the crimes that Europe committed against the Jews in Europe. So I think there must be sort of a, 
distinction between the two. And the fact that the Jews are victimizers in Palestine shouldn't uh, prevent us from seeing that they were victims in Europe. And the fact that they were the ultimate victims in Europe shouldn't prevent us from seeing that they are victimizers now in Palestine. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Raif. Um, we're going to ask a couple more questions before we're going to turn to the audience questions. I see there are already a few. I encourage everyone to put their questions or comments in the Q&A function. But uh, Katya, I think you're going to ask Nura a question at this point. Yes, so um, it's, it's a complicated question, but I think it touches upon um, something that I find highly relevant to some of the confusions surrounding the, the position of the BDS movement. Uh, Nora, would you be able to enlighten us on how you personally navigate a, a political landscape in which uh, BDS activism is, is very often equated with anti-Semitism and, and also perhaps, perhaps in, in direct relation uh, to this, uh, what do you think is the connection between debates that take place on campuses, uh, within civil society, and also um, the media and government institutions? And I'm thinking here specifically uh, within the US context. Yeah, that's an excellent question. And also that goes back into this, you know, what happens in, as an advocate um, in practice, um, by its very nature, this is going to be repetitive and echo much of what my colleagues have said, but let me start with the latter part of your question and say something about what is the, what is, what is the circuit of ideas between campus, government, um, media, and so forth. And what we can see is that there has been a concerted attempt, a top-down uh, attempt, in order to, to squash debate that is otherwise resolved on the ground. So several um, universities had filed Title VI suits um, within the Department of Education accusing uh, student activists of harassing them on campus under previous terms that exist under Title VI based on discrimination, race, nationality, religion, and so forth. In investigations at Rutgers, UC Berkeley, um, and I forget the other campus, the Department of Education unanimously found that, yo, it's, it's really uncomfortable to be a student in the midst of a controversial issue, but there's no discrimination here, right? And then we see the redefinition and the adoption by the DOE of IHRA in order to now make a more expansive definition to, to, to do the work that the previous um, iteration was unable to achieve. Similarly, think about what, you know, our euphoria over the democratization of media and social media. And so here you have, for the first time, we're able to see what's happening in Gaza during these aerial strikes. So we're not just getting these perverted cartoons from the Israeli army telling us what's happening or, uh, you know, just clouds of smoke. We're actually getting Palestinians running away, dying, children's screams. You get these stories. Well, now, we just get another report that Facebook and its audit of itself has demonstrated for us that there is systematic censorship of Palestinian content and not just of Palestinians in Gaza, but all the way to the top. We see Gigi Hadid and her father Mohammed Hadid have their own social media accounts suspended for their intervention. So we do see a very, even when we're winning at the bottom, that the top will come down um, in order to, to squash these debates. Now, I'm gonna take a little bit more time because I was asked a two-part question. Let me get to this question about, well, what about BDS? So in this BDS part, I wanna emphasize that no, it's very easy for us to say that all criticism of Israel is, is tantamount to anti-Semitism or, or so we're accused. And I'm sure that all of us can put together anecdotes that would demonstrate that, right? Palestinian breathing, anti-Semitic. But if we actually you know, get into some texture of it, that's not the way that it's, um, that it's actually broken down, especially in the, in the, in the short life of, of the BDS call since 2005. So from its initial you know, um, publication, BDS has been an anathema to a spectrum of Jewish Zionists. On the most supportive end of that spectrum are the liberal Zionists 
who oppose it only because of one of its demand, the demand for the right of return. The liberal Zionists are in line with ending the occupation, right? There's three demands and the occupation, meaningful equality, right of return. They're okay with the ending the occupation, okay with meaning equality within Israel, and even okay with the mode of protest of boycott. They're not even, they're not opposed to boycott. They're saying, go ahead, boycott, right? But only boycott um, the settlements or uh, enterprises in the West Bank and Gaza. Unlike um, the other pillars, however, the right of return for them is equated as, as, as an in existential threat because of the racist conception that a Palestinian demographic majority would signal the end of the Jewish state. Now, the, the, the opponents to this, the ardent Jewish Zionists, um, are far different. For them, boycott is problematic because it's reminiscent of European racial exclusion. The belief, they, there's a belief that the critique of Israel is tantamount with singling out Israel unfairly. And of course, the demand for the right of return is unequivocally anti-Semitic, um, not merely for undermining a Jewish demographic majority, but for, for, for opposing. This is, and this is also what Shireen and Ra'if and Amos um, uh, intimated already, but for opposing Jewish self-determination in the form of Zionist settler sovereignty. And this argument conflates that Jewish peoplehood and the Jewish state are the same thing, but they're not. If Jewish people want to identify as a people, they certainly can. As Benedict Anderson reminds us, all peoples are imagined communities. But to insist that self-determination of that people is based on a territorial framework, necessitating the forced removal of a whole other people, it's plainly immoral. It's plainly immoral. Now, to get to that and to reject it full stop, we need to, you know, assert this bifurcation, which takes, you know, a little bit more work than a yes or no answer. And certainly for Palestinians, right, accepting this logic is to participate in our own self-annihilation. And yet, we're expected to do that, just that, because racial and colonial frameworks have primed Western audiences to accept Palestinian suffering as nat natural and even necessary. Um, as somehow a, 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 a sacrifice for, for, for these um, Western wrongs. So how do you navigate this as an advocate? There's many, you know, there's, there's many ways to do it. I would say that the primary way is to, you know, address the controversy head on. There's such an attempt to either not say things or to say them in a different way so that we can avert, right? But we then put ourselves, we trap ourselves uh, in, in, you know, um, traps of our own making. And instead we should address things very head on and invite conversation and um, controversy. So, there's three three elements uh, or three pillars of framing that I like to use. One is to address the violent logic that sets up Palestinian death as a predicate element of humanity. This is an opportunity for us to turn the tables, to highlight the contradictions that even within liberal traditions, especially those captured in human rights principles and human rights law, um, to highlight what contradictions is that bringing up, to highlight the racism that makes this logic possible. And other is to actually emphasize the universal character of the Palestinian experience by showing that Israel is not unique. It's a lot like other settler colonies, including the United States, Canada, Australia, South Africa, and so on. And of course, there's so many differences within and between these case studies, but as a structure of settler colonialism, Palestine is one of many, which undermines the whole argument that BDS singles out Israel. Thirdly, and more, uh, and very importantly, is to demand a more robust conversation on anti-Semitism. Shireen gave us a clinic at the beginning of this talk in less than five minutes. We don't even get that in our conversations. We don't talk about anti-Semitism. We need more of it. We need it to be more meaningful. Why is anti-Semitism a form of racism? How was that conversation had in the early 1970s? What are the distinctions between religious and secular anti-Semitism? What's the relationship between Orientalism and anti-Semitism in Europe? How is it manifested in different parts of the world? And why are those distinctions materially significant? And so on and so forth. But this conversation, especially in the United States, is so anemic that nobody has any idea how to navigate a conversation about anti-Semitism, much less the accusation. So the response has been a practice of silence, which is actually to, to submit, right? Is to, is to surrender our own power. So in sum, I would encourage more confrontation, more robust discussion to navigate the political terrain. We need to create more space so as not to be pushed into a corner, which is incredibly hard given all the punishments associated. Just this week, the Hill fired Katie Halper, 
for defending Rashida Tlaib's statement that support for apartheid Israel is not progressive. And yesterday, the New York Times fighter fired Hossam Salem, a photojournalist in Gaza, because of tweets in support of Palestinian resistance. Um, so, I, so how do you do this? We need to talk about it. You can't talk about it. One way, one tactic to create more space is to use the liberal argument of free speech and the legal argument defending free speech and constitutional law. And although that approach has been the primary argument against BDS legislation, I would be very careful not to rely on a free speech argument because of its trappings and limits, which we can discuss later. Suffice it to say that here, using the law defensively and tactically to create more space in order to have other conversations is very worthwhile. Yeah, um, thank you so much, uh, Nora, which leads me directly into the question that I wanted to ask Shireen. It's it's really linked. It's what, Shireen, do you think is a potential for political alliances to fight both anti-Semitism and stand up for Palestinian rights within the U.S.? Um, I don't, I think that that is actually ongoing. It is actually happening. It isn't a potential. Um, and I think one of the things that um, we really have to understand about this particular moment, while we can um, really kind of see it as a, a, um, a, a time of defeat, perhaps, um, I think in many ways, this is a time of immense potential when we see the broad-based celebration of stupidity from Hungary to more recently Italy to you know, the, the, the theater that is the Israeli Knesset to the theater that is the White House, right? This is actually the time to continue building these alliances and to continue holding on to the momentum and the labor that we've been doing for decades, right? Which is opposing anti-Semitism, opposing all forms of racism and opposing Zionist settler colonialism. This didn't start with the IHRA. The, the, the blacklisting, the containment and the confinement of anybody doing critical work on Palestine and critiquing Israel has a very long durée and because of that long durée, because we have been accustomed to that fight, uh, I think that makes the struggle for um, Palestine actually a really important site to navigate the kinds of ways um, that critical thought and critical expression is being targeted, not just in the United States, but also in France, also in the United Kingdom. And here I'm talking about critical race theory, right? We know what that looks like because we have been under that pressure. It is not new to us. And I think here, one of the things that is really, really important um, and the way to be able to recognize this ongoing labor, right? And here I'll just step back and say, you know, I cut my teeth in post-September 11 um, New York you know, as a graduate student with Jews Against the Occupation, right? I mean, which started out as an organization that was called Queer Jews Against the Occupation. We were the people that were in joint struggle back then. This doesn't start with the IHRA, right? I think if we don't really engage those long historical traditions of political mobilizing, we can feel ourselves besieged in the moment that we're in now. And I think that um, the two final things I wanna say is, Number one, I think that um, the you know the the call for boycott divestment sanctions is frightening and has mobilized this amount of black of of backlash because we are actually standing up together in many ways. You know, I grew up in this country, and when I was a student in 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 high school, you know. Um, 
it was really hard to stand up and say anything. The environment is completely different now, and it is in part different because of American Jewish involvement and investment. So I really want to encourage us to think beyond a kind of this, both this presentist moment and a broader kind of defeatism around what is the political moment that we're in. And I think to do that, we have to refuse the kinds of unified homogenized categories that the enlightenment logic imposes on us. What is Europe when we're all talking about Europe? In fact, what is Germany? I mean, Berlin is arguably like the Arab capital of Europe right now. Okay, so it it is actually way more complicated when we talk about the Jews. So there are Palestinian Jews, right? What do we, how do we categorize those people? And so I think it is those erasures that we have to confront as a part of the violence of this ongoing enlightenment logic um, and the problem, you know, of Europe. Like we talk about, you know, the, the Jewish question, the Palestinian question, the black question, whatever. Like I want to talk about the problem of Europe the Europe as a problem, the imagined idea of this Europe as our problem, right? And I think that, you know, in this moment of immense consolidation of the right wing and the rise of self-defined fascists, we actually have no choice but to intensify the ongoing organizing that we're doing together in joint struggle. Thank you all. Uh, I mean, uh, I um, I think this was a um, much needed uh, discussion. I mean, we, we are just starting to scratch the surface. Um, I am glad that we were able to come together. I hope that there will be uh, other uh, contexts in which we will be able to continue that. Um, I'd like to thank all of you. I'd like to thank Shireen, Nura, Raif and Amos. I'd like to uh, thank Kati for um, suggesting um, this conversation, the first case. Um, I uh, like to say that um, the way that it came about, um, uh, this this is then became like a joint venture in terms of you know thinking about it, how we could bring it together. Um, and I'd also like to thank the audience. I'm sorry we didn't have more time to get to the questions, um, but I think it was really. Um, important and uh, worthwhile discussion. Kati, would you like to say a few words? Only thank you so much. Um, I think this was a very productive conversation and I hope we can continue this informally. Okay, thank you.